from your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and it's Monday, January 30th, 2023, as we bring you a new episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. We wanted to talk about Aloy Jimenez in our previous episode, but the Mike Clevenger news hit, and since that's not getting better with that situation. But Aloy still wants to play in the outfield, and he might be moving corners from left to right field and making that happen. We'll discuss why that could work, but also why it's not a great idea. There's a trade rumor to discuss involving the White Sox, and one of the White Sox greats passed away earlier this past week. We'll remember Gary Peters later in the show. Joining me now is the managing editor of SoxMachine.com. It's Jim Margulis. And Jim, we got a Super Bowl. It'll be the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs, even though that pains me to say that, uh, as the 49ers lost in not a heartbreaking way, but more like a backbreaking or arm breaking as uh, Brock Purdy, their third string quarterback, got injured during the game. Then the fourth string quarterback got knocked out. And it resulted in a very non-competitive game as the Eagles won 31 to seven. It just reminds me, Jim, that in professional sports, just how big of factors health and luck are. And maybe that's a thing to keep in mind when talking about the White Sox in 2023. Yeah, my condolences, first of all, to your 49ers. Although I was watching the game, (laughs) I I was teaching curling uh, all afternoon and looking at the game. And I saw what happened to Purdy and just thinking like, that's a pretty good way to to lose in terms of just like, yeah, it's, you know, I saw Niners players after game saying we just couldn't show them anything because the Eagles are good. And when you don't have your top, well, even your top two of your bottom two quarterbacks uh, in in an NFC championship game, it's, you know, understandably they're going to be shorthanded. And so like, yeah, I I was, I was thinking of you, but also thinking like, uh, you know, you can't probably be too invested when the chips are stacked against you like that. You just have to say like, eh, you know, the Eagles are a deserving team. I mean, the Eagles might have been able to beat the Niners with uh, Garoppolo, you know, just, you know, if they had uh-huh. their first, you know, they're that good of a team. So I imagine of all the ways to lose one step away from the Super Bowl, that probably has to be among the easiest. Yeah, I guess the equivalent in baseball would be starting pitcher's arm barks after the first inning, opposing team hits like a couple of home runs the next inning. And all of a sudden you're down five to nothing in the second inning and you don't have enough pitching to get you through the rest of the game. Like that, that was like the equivalent. It's like, no matter what they do, they're not going to be able to move the football. And yeah, it just was a big factor. The 49ers not make it to the Super Bowl, but that's like in any professional sport, right? It, every team in any sport deals with injuries and the teams that make it to the championship, They have what we call this amazing amount of depth. And we think of depth being amazing when those backup players play well enough to help those teams win. And for the 49ers, for example, they got to the NFC Championship game with their third string quarterback. So they had a lot of depth and they had a lot of talent surrounding as far as that team. But when you're going up against a team that doesn't have as many health uh, factors going to that game like the Philadelphia Eagles, that's the deciding factor. And when talking about the White Sox this upcoming year, we we know that health is going to be a huge factor because we are not very confident in the White Sox depth. The White Sox dealt with injuries in 2021. They overcame that with some luck. They did not have luck on their side in 2022, and luck doesn't appear to be on their side before even the 2023 season starts. So that, that 49ers loss just brought back like a, a sports philosophy that no matter how we analyze this game and we analyze this particular team, the biggest factors are things that are out of their control for the most part. And it's out of our control as well. Just how healthy and how lucky (laughs) the white Sox are going to be in 2023. Yeah. I guess with the white Sox, you can argue that maybe some of the stuff last year was in their control, like playing Larry sure. Garcia when he's falling down and Luis Robert when he's letting go with one hand and Michael Kopech when his knee buckles on him. Like they had a lot of questionable injury handling and that's going to be something that's kind of fascinating to watch. I think when the projections come out, whether it's zips or Pakoda or what have you, like, I think uh, it was uh, penals who made this point on Twitter saying that like, 
the projections are probably going to say they're a 500 team, but based on how unhealthy they were and how incompetent they were in handling their health issues last year, like there could be a lot of just dormant upside that is not captured by these projection models because I don't think, uh, you know, any you know, algorithm really knows how to handle just how poorly they managed poor health. Um, you know, obviously the, the games missed is something like Tim Anderson is going to be docked for availability mm-hmm. and Luis Robert and Aloy Jimenez and so forth. And I mean, that shows up in one regard, but that was a case where just like, if they're looking to sandbag, you know, basically give themselves a handicap for next year in terms of like, Oh, if we lose early and we start playing with a handicap and then we turn it on, uh, we'll be able to really just, uh, you know, take advantage of a few weeks of beating the odds because uh, they did not know how to account for uh, intentional uh, just, you know, being underwater on purpose, which is kind of how they acted with their injuries last year. So that is unsatisfying because like a lot of the, you know, players are still around uh, the front office still around and we don't know exactly what the training staff will or won't do. They have Jeff head there. Who's new and a couple of at least one, uh, strength and conditioning guy who's new uh, levels below, but still James Cruck is there, and you know these we don't exactly know whether it's a um, you know they're they're completely uh, changing the hierarchy or how things are reported or how they're handled or if it's just throwing a new guy in there and seeing what he has to offer. That's kind of unclear right now. So yeah, it's you know. I think that's the big question. And, you know, as you mentioned, like the Guardians had exceptional depth, but it was unproven. Like we wouldn't have said they had great depth last year. They had maybe interesting depth, like guys who sure. might have something going for them, but also could struggle like Stephen Kwan. Like there's no reason necessarily to buy into him, like being as good as he was last year in, in, in the specific way that he helped the Guardians. Um, like, but he was very good. Uh, you know, so that that's kind of the, there is like a self-fulfilling prophecy to it, just like with, uh, it reminds you of pitchers like Steve Stone says, like he's working really slow and that's why he's struggling. And it's like, no, he's probably struggling. And that's why he's working really slow because just nothing's feeling right. It's like you could, you could argue both ways. Like guys doesn't have good rhythm. And so he's struggling or he's struggling. And that's why he doesn't have good rhythm. And it's kind of the same thing with, with depth. Like when, uh, you know, it's like 2021 with the White Sox and Jake Lamb and Brian Goodwin and Gavin Sheets and Jake Berger are all delivering hero turns for two weeks at a time. Like, yeah, there's a uh, next man up way to go. And then when it's like last year, just nope, it's they're out of ideas. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, it's it's something that does kind of write itself a little bit uh, based on how they play. But, you know, based on what I think it's also something where teams can earn benefit of the doubt. The Guardians earned it with how they were able to do it last year. And uh, so, you know, you can you have to fear them a little bit, whereas the White Sox, uh, they have to prove that they're they know what they're doing. And the guys who have been banged up can stay healthy. Well, hopefully health and luck is on the White Sox side in 2023, because the first topic that we're going to talk about on this podcast is only going to come to fruition if health is not on the White Sox side and if luck is not on the White Sox side. And that's Aloy Jimenez playing more outfield than we would be hoping for in 2023, question mark. Aloy Jimenez had his media time this past week, and there's quite a few stories that have been written about this, not just on SoxMachine.com, but all over outlets that cover baseball, both locally and nationally. And the one topic that I spoke about with Bernstein and Holmes on 670 The Score last week, if you got a chance to listen to that segment, I got peppered with questions about the idea of Aloy Jimenez playing in right field because he, Jim, does not want to give up on the outfield dream. And I don't blame him. He's a baseball player. He doesn't want to be known as a designated hitter. He still wants to prove that he can play in the outfield, even though the data, the tendencies, the injury suggest this is not a good idea, Aloy. Mm-hmm. You wrote, I thought, a very good column on Sunday on SoxMachine.com about this possibility. And it's not so much a possibility that it's going to be a reality when you take into consideration of the White Sox injury past with the players that are going to be in the outfield. And they're hoping on the side of luck with Oscar Colas, an unproven talent, making the jump and be able to hit immediately in the major leagues to prevent Aloy Jimenez from playing in the outfield. But in the past, White Sox tendencies, especially from last year, Jim, if that continues to 2023, yeah, we're going to see a lot of Aloy Jimenez in right field. And there's really no way to 
uh, hide it, you know, after an injury, which I think is the troubling thing or why, you know, when we're talking about extra outfielders and you were particularly keen on Adam Duvall, like being a guy who can like maybe fill in center fields if Luis Robert gets hurt. So Oscar Colas doesn't have to go there. And so then you have, uh, you, you still have your corners intact the way you originally planned. And right now, Jake Marisnik is not a bad guy to have in Charlotte. Like he's a good non-roster invitee for spring training. Like that's, you know, uh, applause for that one. But part of the reason I imagine he signed with the White Sox is because they don't have anybody. You know, when you're looking at uh, how many breaks you need to crack a roster, if you're Jake Marisnik or if you're Billy Hamilton, you know, or what have you, the guys who are on the outside looking in, like there's only one. <laughs> there's only one, uh, you know, wrong step that needs to be taken before somebody like Marisnik is is sorely needed. And even Marisnik could break camp with the White Sox if things go well for him because they still could use somebody who covers center in a, a true fashion. So it is a case where like, you know, even if, you know, somebody tweaks a, you know, hamstring or like gets hit with a pitch in the knee and has to miss a few games, like all of a sudden, like Jimenez has to play the outfield. It's not like necessarily like a, uh, months long injury like we saw with Jimenez and Robert last year, just the over the course of the season getting banged up. It's like Gavin Sheets and Saloy Jimenez. And as much as you might, you know, I guess hesitate the thought, like Jimenez is a better outfielder than Sheets, at least in left field or like a corner spot when it comes to range and catching the ball. It's just that, you know, Jimenez has no track record of durability and he hurts himself in high exertion plays, whereas Sheets is. He's built to last, apparently. Like, he threw himself around the outfield with uh, a handful of ill-advised dives, and you could almost, like, see the camera shake when he landed because he's not a <laughs> he's a large man who does not really, uh, you know, hit the ground gracefully or it doesn't seem like he disperses force well, and he just gets up and he's he's back at it. So, uh, like, if, if Sheets, or I should say if Jimenez had Sheets's track record when it came to health and really not missing games – then it would be ugly and it's fine. You know, it would be ugly. It'd be hard to watch. You know, you'd see the occasional base taken on his arm, but it'd be fine. Like you wouldn't have that health concern lingering over everything, which I think is the number one fear. And then everything else is like, well, he's not a good outfielder. He doesn't have an arm. Like those are all secondary concerns to will he hurt himself in a new corner, not having familiarity with, uh, the, all the angles and the number of steps to the warning track in that direction, et cetera. Do you remember the former Yankees prospect that got traded to the A's? Dustin Fowler. Yes, Dustin Fowler, who's currently still suing the White Sox for his injury. That's another lawsuit I forgot about that's still active uh, against the Chicago White Sox. Uh, Dustin Fowler sued the White Sox because something was amiss in the right field corner, or at least that's his argument and why he suffered that severe yeah. injury. It was like an electrical box to not have it. padding. And like, it was like the only one that didn't, and you know, among the, at least according to, you know, the, their side, the lawsuit said like, that was just the one box with, you know, hard edges, sharp corners that was not padded or hidden away in a satisfactory manner. That fear of Aloy playing a right field and moving to that corner, a guarantee right field, like that's where I could see him getting hurt. Because it is a little awkward little corner of the stadium. Like it, it was just not Fowler. Like we've seen even Adam Eaton at times and when Adam Engel has played right field, that when you get closer to the net there, you get closer to that corner, it like sneaks up on every single outfielder as it juts out. Uh, running into the padding, and we all know about Aloy running into the net and falling into the net. Uh, so that's my fear, is that that's how mm -hmm. Aloy hurts himself. He's going after a ball in the corner, and uh, he hits that wall awkwardly. And then all of a sudden, you lose Aloy for weeks, if not months. Yeah, and it's, the thing is, like, you know, when I saw the reaction, the initial, you know, Jimenez wanting to play and Griffal uh, a couple days earlier talked about it on the score saying that, you know, you're going to see him out there. Like we're, you know, I think he said something like we look forward to, you know, seeing what he looks like. And um, the problem is like, it's true. And if you look at one wrong step or if, you know, Coloss needs a caddy in right field, uh, you know, right-handed compliment to his left-handed bat. If he finds lefties really tough or he just, all sorts of misfortune can hit. Like there are a few outfield permutations that don't involve either Aloy Jimenez in right field or Larry Garcia in center or right. Like just, you know, in terms of like, you know, an outfield against lefties. So it's 
you know, not what you want, but you have to acknowledge it. You can't really talk around it. It kind of reminds me of, you know, after uh, my son was born, my wife and I set up like a living will and you have like a whole bunch of uncomfortable conversations there about like what happens if this happens and you have to acknowledge it because like, yeah, this is why we're doing it. This things, you know, these things are, you know, could very much happen and you have to prepare for yourself. You don't feel good talking about it. You rather spend as few sentences as possible talking about it and just leave it at that. But you have to acknowledge that it's going, you know, the, the possibility is there just so it's covered. So you can understand like, you know, that Griffal is seeing the same thing. He's not wish casting Robert, Ben and Tenny and Colas play 150 games across the diamond. And then like, oh, you might have, you know, Jimenez in right field twice a year. Like it, it is a more realistic, you know, it's just, it's something where, you can't talk about it for very long without getting depressed or feeling like, and in this case, like, you know, it also brought it to mind when it comes to like setting up a will. It's just like, you can't sound excited about it because that's weird. <laughs> you can't say like, oh, you know, if, it, yeah, like this is a chance to move into a better school district. Like you can't, there's no way to spin it positively just, you know, when it comes to the, uh, you know, that's kind of disaster striking. So you can't like really, you, you can't speak on it long. And if you speak on it, you can't, mm -hmm you can't really voice it positively without sounding delusional or like something's really wrong with the way you're looking at the world. <laughs> so it's just, it's a tough situation to talk about. I'm glad he mentioned it. I'm glad he acknowledged it. Cause yeah, that's the truth. Like, you know, it might have to happen and white Sox fans might have to brace themselves or, you know, you might have an argument over whether Ben and should play rights. Uh, even if he's a good left fielder who has kind of washed out of right field, according to the way the Royals played him, it's, it's going to be tough and it's going to be a test of Griffal. And I really wish that Rick Hahn armed him better. Um, I guess the hope is this year that like Colas is just an above average right fielder who deserves to play there every day. Um, you know, Robert stays healthy, Ben and going to be around. And then like next year, the conversation might become harder for Jimenez to argue himself into like, where are you going to play? You think you're better than Colas. You think you're better than Robert. You think you're better than Ben Like you're not like, you're great. You're a great hitter. We need you here. Like, you know, just, it, it, it'll be a lot more, uh, frank of a conversation with Jimenez if Colas and, you know, Robert and, and, and Ben and Henny can address their own question marks that Ben and Henny definitely is the fewest, but yeah, it's right now, given the question marks, just, you have to keep him engaged. He's allowed to feel entitled to some action based on how Colas hasn't proven himself. So yeah, it's, it's going to be a little bit awkward and, you hope that uh, just you know it's one or you know once a week, uh, maybe twice a week, and you hope that uh, uh, there is a liberal application of defensive help uh, in late in games if they have the lead, and uh, you hope that Colas is somebody you don't mind uh, if he has to hit for himself later in the game after um, appearing as a defensive replacement. So the luck part, Luis Robert, don't get hurt this year. Don't miss any games, Luis Robert. <laughs> the White Sox need good luck there. And then health, making sure, and also part of the good luck, Oscar Colas performs well and proves that he has stay in power of the major leagues right away for the Chicago White Sox. And health, nobody get hurt. Because uh, if Colas gets hurt, or if Robert gets hurt and Colas moves over to center field, out of your options of Gavin Sheets, Andrew Vaughn, and Aloy Jimenez, I'm with you, Jim. I'd rather have Aloy Jimenez at right field outside of Gavin Sheets and Andrew Vaughn. Last year in 2022, out of the 198 outfielders that made at least 10 attempts at fly balls in the major leagues, Gavin Sheets ranked 186th and Andrew Vaughn 195th in outfield jumps to support your argument mm -hmm. on just how poor Gavin Sheets and Andrew Vaughn move because they are first basemen for a reason. One thing I wanted to ask you about and just pick your brain, a hypothesis of sorts I brought this point up on Bernstein and Holmes. Eloy Jimenez, the fastest throw that he made in 2022 when he did play in the outfield was 81 miles per hour. His max throw in 2021 was 86 miles per hour. His max throw in 2020 was 91 miles per hour. Now, his average throw has ranged from 81 to 78. Last year, Eloy Jimenez's average throw from the outfield was 78 miles per hour. Jake McCarthy for the Arizona Diamondbacks, his average throw in right field last year was 81.4 miles per hour. That was the worst in Major League Baseball. So if Aloy Jimenez doesn't throw the ball harder in 2023, he will have by far the weakest arm in Major Leagues in right field. 
But since his pec injury, that's something we really haven't even considered is just the throwing speed of Aloy Jimenez. Has he lost this? Is this a skill? Because 91's not bad from an outfield spot. That's pretty good. That's that's above average if you can average 91. But is that something that he's lost since his pec injury? I don't think so. I don't think that's... Uh, I remember it being a concern when he was an outfielder like with the Cubs and then after the White Sox traded for him and the White Sox were moving him around in the different corner spots trying to figure out like, can he stick in right? And I remember like, you know, it was kind of a two front war he was fighting in that like, even if he had uh, really good reads and such, his arm would still be a liability out there. So it's, you know... I, I think an act of concern, and I think you're right. Like it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be curious in terms of how he, Pedro Grafal, I mean, handles like that aspect of it. Cause you mentioned on Bernstein Holmes that Grafal talked about like how the White Sox outfielders were easy to run on. And basically like whether it was their um, arm strength, whether it was their indecision or their like the routes they took in gathering the ball, it, it seemed like, you know, the, the team's, uh, in that that had enough foot speed on the base paths, like not even exceptional speed, like base stealing speed, extra base speed. Just anybody who had decent speed could go from first to second on a, a ball that's just right of center field, or they could go from first to home if a ball goes in the corner because they're you know, rounded off very you know, um, generously. It's uh, a case where, yeah, uh, if Grafal's talking the outfielders this year, like spring training, first day at camp or something like that. And he stresses like, we need to be, if we don't have arm strength, we need to be very quick in terms of where we're going with the ball, getting the ball in, knowing where our cutoff men are, like giving our cutoff men the chance to make up the ground that you know, outfielders can't do by themselves. And that's not good. That feels like almost high school type stuff or Tom Amansky, like hit the cutoff man. Like, you know, give your, you know, just, yeah. it does feel like a little bit going back to school, but you know, this is kind of where the white Sox are right now. And yeah, I'm looking at 2020 and he threw his average uh, throw was 80.6, but his top speed was 91. So it could be a case where like, maybe if there's a little bit urgency in his throws to where maybe he can get a little bit more out of his arm, um, cause when I'm looking at the bottom, you know, of 14 qualifying outfielders, uh, Jimenez is 10th at 80.6, but his top throw is 91.2. And that's all that's better than all, but four of them. So perhaps like if he steps into mm -hmm. it, he could be fine. It just, he, you know, is very cautious about where he's coming in and just his average throws don't have a whole lot of conviction. So you know, whether it's the arm strength or whether it's just, you know, being able to dial it up with a clear idea of where he's going with it, you know, it's both are problems, but one is maybe solvable, whereas arm strength is kind of, he's stuck with it. And I'm curious when Grafal's out there and, and working with Daryl Boston, who is only have to, you know, work with outfielders now. And I, I don't, you know, that's something just, uh, you know, set aside the off field things with Boston or just the, the history, uh, you know, the, the, decades old history with him. It's just like, you know, the White Sox have been so terrible in all the aspects of outfield play to what, like, why is he still around? Why is he the guy in charge of it when they couldn't do it last year? Like, I, I don't get why right. he's still around aside from like, you know, what people say about him being like, uh, you know, best friends of Kenny Williams and sure. Um, but yeah, that's really w what we're looking at here is just almost like back to basics. And that's why it's hard. You know, when Jimenez is talking about how right field's easier than left field and like, maybe, but I also remember like Kenny Williams talking about Ken Griffey Jr. saying like center field is the easiest because you don't have to worry about running into anything. <laughs> like that's like when, when Kenny Griffey Jr. was like, you know, 38 going on 47 <laughs> when it came to just like the age that he moved. Like, yeah, just you can always spin in an outfield position as easier in some regard. And given that, you know, Jimenez has clowned it up in left field, you know, kind of been very dramatic with his falls and his, you know, falling into the net and Luis Robert calling him off and mugging. Like it's funny and entertaining and such, but it's hard to take him seriously is like, you, you can't project a lack of seriousness and then feel like you can uh, talk about the finer points like that thing and be taken seriously. Like he's got to prove it to really back up this talk. There's, there's no reason to take him seriously. There's a reason to have an open mind just because of the lack of options, but that's really it. Yeah. It's, 
it's not, I don't want to say fascinating, but it's disturbing on just how quickly the depth vanishes in the outfield for the White Sox. Like, plan A looks promising. Like, if you're wanting to be optimistic, and Andrew Benatendi, Luis Robert, Oscar Colas has got some potential to be a good outfield unit. But any of these guys get hurt, it's not like the White Sox have a budding outfield prospect. This is kind of where... Yolki Cespedes not improving his batted ball skills is really hurting him because Yolki Cespedes, if he could cut down on his strikeout rate and have better pitch recognition and prove that he could walk at least 6% of the time, he would have an honest chance of making this team. He would. Mm -hmm. Because defensively, I don't think there's any question that he could play in the corners in left field or right field. The, the problem is his ability to hit the ball. And that's why he may start again in Birmingham in 2023, when it feels like he's been there forever. And I think he's entering his age 26 season, but that's on Cespedes to get better at the plate. Like there's opportunities here, but yeah, we're going to probably see Jake Marisnik at some point with the white Sox. We might see Billy Hamilton again at some point with the white Sox. It's like, this is where the player development gap is. It's just, okay, who's the next budding outfielder for the Chicago White Sox? And they really don't have one right now. Yeah, it's really, you know, Colos, uh, top tier. And then like three tiers down is Cespedes and Luis Mieses. And, oh, yeah. and Luis you know, Mieses. He's, yeah. Mieses is fine. He's just, you know, he's still matriculating up the ladder. Like he just got to Birmingham last year at the end of last year encouraging start but still has probably two years to go before you could consider him for a major league job and so yeah it's it's a a very bare patch right now um and Cespedes, is like i i still liken him to adam angle like just kind of a you know angle in the minors even the majors like just had a really stiff swing um not a whole lot of fluidity and i think Cespedes being a, a smaller guy like probably five nine or so, like he can generate some power and some bat speed, but he really needs to have all of his being going into that torque and that bat speed. So I think it just makes it hard for him to control the bat. And if he tries to ratchet it down, work on bat control, like the power is not there. So like it's, he has to strike a choice between like, you know, impact power, you know, impact contact or enough contact and is the contact going to be meaningful in any way. And it's, it's tough. Uh, but, you know, that's why the White Sox were able to sign him, or at least, you know, why other teams didn't uh, weren't as interested as the White Sox were in the open market, because he did have some gap when it came to just whether he'd be able to, um, you know, put bat to ball against upper level pitching. Like the defense is fine, but I think that's why I like him to add angle like he's fine in center, uh, good in the corners. Hell of a lot of fun to watch him throw. Um, but just when it comes to trying to get anything from him offensively, it's going to be a project. A couple of weeks ago, if you asked me over under 20 and a half games, Aloy Jimenez plays in the outfield, I would have smashed the under. But after this conversation and thinking aloud with you, Jim, I might be leaning to the over. I won't officially make my guess until we have our position preview podcast in March during spring training. But now having this conversation with you and reading your column on Sunday and thinking it through, we might see more Aloy Jimenez in the outfield than we would like to or expect to in 2023 when you consider all the factors regarding the White Sox outfield situation. Yeah, it's tricky because like when you said that, you know, under, I said like, no, definitely over. Then I realized like, oh, but he might get hurt himself. <laughs> so like, <laughs> right. that's, that's like, oh, okay. That, then, that, you know, if you could like, if you assumed he would played 150 games, I'd say definitely over. Uh, but you yeah. know, if he steps on a base wrong or if he collides with an outfield or hits a wall or just, you know, something happens to where like he can't play the outfield physically, then yeah, he might uh, be under for reasons that have nothing to do with any of the other outfielders. Uh, but yeah, if you could somehow control for him playing 150 games, I'm thinking it's more like 40, 50 at this point, uh, whether it's you know full games or having to play there. We're not trying to scare you folks, but <laughs> that's just the current situation right now with the White Sox outfield. And who knows, maybe Aloy Jimenez is teasing that his body's going to look different when everybody arrives to spring training. Maybe he's lost some weight. Maybe he's one of the dozen White Sox players that's entering camp in the best shape of their life. Uh, we'll see if his mobility has improved. We'll see if he could throw harder. We'll see if he looks better in the outfield 
before he joins the team Dominican Republic for the World Baseball Classic in early March. And uh, fingers crossed that if Eloy Jimenez does play in the right field, that A, he doesn't embarrass himself, and B, does not injure himself as well, though, because the White Sox really need his bat this upcoming year. But Jim and I are going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. But coming up next, we'll talk about a trade rumor involving the White Sox. And remember Gary Peters. Welcome back to the Sox Machine Podcast. All right, some transaction news that might be of interest to White Sox fans. One, Josh Harrison officially becomes an old friend after the White Sox bought him out for $1.5 million. Harrison is now signed with the Philadelphia Phillies for $2 million to be a bat on their bench. So he'll get $3.5 million in 2023 to play baseball, one and a half from the White Sox, $2 million from Philadelphia. The other rumor and that we teased before the break as far as the trade rumor, this comes from Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic, and this was this past Tuesday after the Mike Clevenger news. So the rumor I mentioned in our last podcast, the timing was pretty sus, but I guess the White Sox and the Kansas City Royals have talked about a Nicky Lopez swap in which the White Sox could possibly use Lopez at second base in 2023. Jim, you wrote about this particular trade idea and why the White Sox should not entertain it. As a reminder, Nicky Lopez, I think he's from Naperville. Mm -hmm. Uh, Local product. (laughs) Very good in 2021. Uh, Lopez was not good in 2022, as you wrote, Jim. And that's why when you already have a revolving door type of situation at the position with Romy Gonzalez, Lenin Sosa, Lurie Garcia, maybe even Jose Rodriguez, that... Acquiring Nicky Lopez does not make that position outlook any clear. Well, my, I guess my chief objection was that he was a Royal, and I think the White Sox are have a dangerous uh, concentration of Royals <laughs> already on the team with Pedro Grafal and Eddie Rodriguez and Mike Tozar and such, and Andrew Benintendi, though he had the Yankees in between. But just like when you have so many people coming over from an organization that was beneath them in the standings and not really having a whole lot of upward mobility yet. Uh, Just importing all those guys seems like not great. And so like, I'd like them to diversify, you know, where they're coming from a little bit. Uh, Same thing with like the pitching side, like everybody who the White Sox have acquired knows Ethan Katz and like, that's okay, but it does feel like they're outsourcing their player evaluation to their coaches when their coaches have, you know, other things to do. Uh, so that makes me slightly uncomfortable. But, yeah, Lopez is, you know, I understand, you know, that he seems like he could be a high-variance player based on just whether the balls are falling his way because um, he doesn't have really any power. He's kind of like Nick Madrigal. If, you know, Madrigal, like his 2021 was like, Nick Madrigal, like uh, his best possible form. We're talking about like a four to five win player based on uh, batting average, lack of strikeouts, uh, running the base as well. Uh, obviously, this doesn't really fit Nick Madrigal because he didn't really run the base as well at the White Sox. But this is what the, the White Sox thought they were getting when they drafted him where they did. But, you know, without a whole lot of impact contact, you know, when you look at three of his four years being you know, very much subpar with the bat and thinking like he has to, um, you know, have all of the batting average gods on his side to make his approach work. And he just, you know, it, the, the contact does not go far. He doesn't make outfielders turn around. Um, you know, it, the, the balls do not get scorched through the infield. Like there's a whole lot of reason to think like he's earned what he's, uh, you know, what he's produced in three of the four years that were not anything worthwhile. And this is a bench player. And I'm just thinking like, if they like that player, then why didn't they tender Danny Mendick and pay him 1 million versus, you know, paying mm. Nicky Lopez 3 million and plus whoever they traded for him. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And yeah, the timing seemed like more like the thing of just like, here's a trade rumor that we can give you. That's not out and out lying to you uh, reporters that we sometimes need um, that we can you know, distract some people with. Uh, this is all we got because we just haven't done much on any front. Yeah. That's kind of the impression that I got as well. When it comes to that rumor, we'll see. I mean, the Royals have already traded within the division, sending Michael a Taylor to the Minnesota twins. I like that trade from a twins perspective Because you just don't know with Byron Buxton. Or maybe we do know. We do know that Buxton's going to get hurt. And when Buxton gets hurt, he misses a lot of time. And Michael A. Taylor, I don't think 
there is any objection for his ability to play center field defensively. The bat gets hot and cold, and it's cold more times than not. But replacing Buxton with Michael A. Taylor as your fourth outfielder to man center field if Buxton gets hurt or Buxton needs to spend a couple days as the DH. I like that move from a Minnesota Twins perspective, but here for the White Sox, I just don't know if Nicky Lopez moves the meter for me at second base. Yeah, I, I don't quite get it. You're talking about like, you know, in the three years that he wasn't uh, a gold glover or gold glove candidate plus like, you know, 300 hitter. Like it's, you're kind of re- talking replacement level and it does make sense. Like you're, you just, there, there's really no impact contact, like 292 slugging percentage. So not even slugging 300. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not a great profile. And it's somebody who like, if he were DFA'd, like sure, claim him. Like you, there's, there's something there, but trying to get him, like having to pry him loose from the Royals, I, I do not like. All right. So we both get that trade rumor a thumbs down so it'll probably get processed on Wednesday uh, <laughs> uh, our last topic uh, is a bit on the the sober side here uh, one of the White Sox greats passed away this past week on Thursday January 26 2023 that was Gary Peters he was 85 years old and Gary Peters for the White Sox fans that grew up in the 1960s was a key member of that stretch for the Chicago White Sox as he won the Rookie of the Year in 1963. He pitched in 258 games with the White Sox, making 216 starts. His career ERA with the White Sox was 2.92, and using advanced metrics, Peters had a six-war season in 1963. He had a 4.2-war season in 1964. That was the year the White Sox won their last nine games of the regular season to fall one game short of the New York Yankees for the American League pennant. Uh, He had a 5.3 war season in 1966 and had a 3.9 war season in 1967. Peters was a two-time All-Star in 1964 and 1967, and he won the American League ERA titles twice back in 1963 and 1966, and he had a career 21.4 war. That is the eighth highest in White Sox history since integration. And I love going to Sabre Gym, and when ex-White Sox players unfortunately do pass away because I think Sabre just does an excellent job when they got profiles of players and capturing just not what they did on the field as far as their big moments and all the stats they compiled, but they also add some narrative to these players as well. And with Peters, yes, he was very successful, but it took him a long time Uh, to break through with the major leagues. He was known as a very good AAA pitcher when he joined the White Sox in 1959. It took him like four years to finally make his break with the White Sox, and he was out of options going to that 1963 season. And it's uh, really remarkable just how successful he was with the White Sox during the 60s. And like I mentioned, for some of our older listeners, they have reached out via email and in the comments section that they rem- they remember Gary Peters very fondly when looking back at those teams. Yeah, it's been a rough go for that rotation because Juan Pizarro, he died uh, two years ago. Then Joe Horland died last year, and now Peters is gone. And even Ray Herbert, who was, I think he was like earlier in the decade, like 1962 was his big year, um, preceded them, and he died like a couple days ago. So it's been a really rough ride for you know that area of White Sox teams. And and I always thought that Arrow was overlooked because you're talking about 1963 to 65. Only time in White Sox history that they won 90 games in three consecutive seasons. Just uh, they won 94, 98, and 95 games. Wow. And you never hear anything about them. The White Sox never really tout that era. They kind of skip ahead from 59 to 77 with the Hitmen and then 83 winning ugly. Um, and it's one thing like when, you know, 83 because they won – the division, like that snapped the drought. Like, of course, remember that season, especially the way they played in the second half, but like the 77 team, you know, maybe Bill Veck and, you know, just his strategy and the way, how, how fondly he was looked upon as an owner for stoking that excitement when they really needed it was clutch, but like didn't accomplish what the 60 teams did. And yet like you never really heard about them aside from like, you know, the, um, you know, 
parents and grandparents and uh, some of the authors like uh, Richard Lindbergh and, and Bob Vanderberg, who are, you know, have been doing really good work in that regard. And even Vanderberg passed away uh, last year. So, you know, he, he's a voice that uh, was always great for hearing about these guys. But I remember I got the DVD of the White Sox greatest moments after they won the World Series. And after the 59, talking about how they lost in the World Series, like they basically skipped ahead until like 83. Like they said that like, oh, they were great teams, but you're like, but they couldn't quite get over the hump until 83. And just so much of these great performances you're talking about have been just overshadowed. And like, I remember when Pizarro died, like finally some footage of him in a White Sox uniform. And it's a shame, like they didn't do more to pay tribute to those teams while all these guys are still alive because people really talk about them as, is really remarkable. Pete Ward was another one. And uh, I remember that DVD, like Bo Jackson got like five minutes on a, you know, 110 minute DVD or something like that. Like in Bo Jackson is fun, but like his impact on White Sox history is minimal. Like you, it was a cool story, but like, it just felt like, you know, I, I guess fan service for recent generations. And I remember that like, yeah, neat. He was a phenomenon. Cool. Like I, I you know, fun but also like he just didn't really do a whole lot compared to these guys who were part of some really great White Sox teams year after year in the 60s so it, it's nice that we hear about him now but I wish the White Sox had done more while they were alive and another fun thing about Peters is he was a hell of a hitter for a pitcher um, looking at his uh, record over course of 14 season 19 homers and 102 RBIs uh, hit four homers from the 1964 White Sox had a pinch hit walk-off homer he batted sixth in the game like he was a respected bat, like especially some of those White Sox teams could not really hit, especially for power. So when they needed a deep, uh, a deep threat late in the game, like they'd sometimes turn to him and not without reason. And this is the era when White Sox pitchers would hit consistently. And what I like about the Sabre profile is that they mentioned in 1964, Peters was supposed to lay down a bunt. He failed twice. And on two strikes, he hits a home run to give them the lead. And manager Al Lopez decides that, all right, Peters, you're my primary pinch hitter uh, from the left-hand side for the rest of the season. Like, using his starting pitcher uh, to be his left-handed go-to bat in late-game situations in that 1964 season. And he won his last four starts as well in that torrid run for the White Sox to try to catch the New York Yankees back in 1964. And, like, I enjoy the little tidbits. Like, he didn't play high school baseball. And his dad was someone that played a lot of minor league baseball and a White Sox scout saw him and brought Peters from Pennsylvania to Comiskey Park for a tryout. And the first type of agreement that Peters signed was one that allowed him to go to college. And when he was done with classes that he could join a minor league team, which I thought that was really intriguing. So he wouldn't be pitching to the the minor leagues until June. And when he even joined the team, he wasn't known much as a pitcher, more of a first baseman, but the White Sox had that position covered. So out of necessity of him to continue his baseball career, or at least that dream, then he became a pitcher. And he was the first White Sox rookie pitcher to ever win the Rookie of the Year award, which is great. Uh, to to hear and winning the ERA tw- uh, ERA title twice and even the advanced metrics really hold up for Gary Peters and as you mentioned Jim the White Sox could do more here I mean I I, I get I get it it is tough when you are a franchise that has existed more than 120 years but it's also a little disappointing like when other stadiums have the Hall of Fame that fans could visit and the White Sox don't mm-hmm. have that. They have enough stuff to make a Hall of Fame, but but they don't have it. And I feel like if they did have it, even for like for myself, I shouldn't have to wait until I get the news that unfortunately an ex White Sox player passed away, and that forces me to do more research about this particular player because I don't know a lot about them, like Gary Peters, and then walk away and be like, oh wow, this guy was really good. I should have known more about him. And I kind of put the onus on the White Sox to teach me that rather than try to teach myself that because I didn't have any Mm -hmm. relatives that made me a White Sox fan. I'm an idiot. I picked the White Sox by myself. (laughs) Uh, I've had that (laughs) thought the last few days. But what a career for Gary Peters. And, And I know that based on the messages that Jim and I have received, for those that grew up as a White Sox fan in the 1960s, you guys remember him fondly. And, uh, he lived a long life. He was 85 years old and he had one heck of a career with the White Sox. 
Yeah, it's fun looking at the 1964 White Sox. Uh, White Sox pitchers hit seven homers uh, total. Uh, him and Juan Pizarro, like Peters and Juan Pizarro were the power threats. White Sox first baseman uh, as a team hit nine. <laughs> Maybe. So that's why they pinch hit late in games because yeah, center fielders hit three, catchers hit seven, second baseman hit six. This is why Peters was pinch hitting because <laughs> the power threats dried up quickly outside of like Pete Ward and Ron Hansen on the left side. Are there any other overlooked eras of the White Sox franchise? Because as you mentioned, 63 through 65, the only time the White Sox have won 90 games in, consecu- in three consecutive years, we thought that might have been happening during this contention window, but it has not. Uh, Are there any other overlooked eras uh, while we're on that topic, Jim? Not really. I mean, like the 50s has been rounded down to kind of like 1959 and Minnesota. And so maybe like the earlier 50s, um, you know, might have been overlooked a little bit in terms of some specifics. But I mean, like you had guys like, you know, Louis Aparicio and like Chico Carrasquel is well known. And, uh, you know, they, they certainly had enough players succeed through 1959 to where like you could piece together what those teams are like, even if you didn't hear so much about like the 1954 White Sox directly, like Al Lopez, you know, you know, et cetera. Like you get the idea based on what we know from 59. And then like, it was so dark in like the forties and thirties that like, yeah, not a whole lot there. Um, some individual performances that we hear about in Ted's Sporkle quizzes, but <laughs> that's about it. Um, yeah, that, that's what kind of stuck out to me about the sixties is like, there isn't that much White Sox success to know about. Like there's, 72 and 77 and 83 like those years are covered uh, 72 i think more in recent history is like dick allen is getting his due um in recent years like some before he passed and uh and, and you know certainly you know it, it, that's continuing as his hall of fame case gains steam but we're learning more about you know, his impact you know, just because he was such a a gargantuan in terms of just what he could do on the baseball field so he's lifted up 72 by himself but I guess like the White Sox of the 60s don't really have that one guy. And especially on the offensive side, like Pete Ward was as close as they got. And Pete Ward was not Dick Allen and, and Ward was a good player, but just not quite that kind of transcendental power that could really just command the conversation by himself. And so I think that's why we missed out. And, you know, maybe if they beat the Yankees one of those years, then, yeah, we'd know about them. But finishing second you can't yeah I guess it's kind of sad to talk about like these great teams that never did anything but it is you know the truth (laughs) you're talking about like you know uh yeah going back to the top with Aloy Jimenez like you have to talk about him in right field because like yeah he might have to play there and so with the White Sox like uh you know they haven't had much success but the 1960 teams were as successful as they've ever been in certain regards. And they probably should have been talked about more while a lot of these guys were still alive. You know, what's fascinating looking at the promotions calendar for the Chicago White Sox. They're not celebrating the 1993 White Sox this year. It's the 30th anniversary of them winning the American league West. I think they are. Are they? I think in, I think in April, did I miss that promotion as I was scrolling through? Yeah. Let me take a look. I think in April they are. Cause I've got questions cause I was just trying to think of like overlooked teams and we don't talk about the 93 team a whole lot. Yeah. April 15th, 1993 American league West division champs crew. Oh, it's a crew next sweater. So I don't know if that's all they're doing and putting in sweater form, but they are paying at least some tribute. I don't know if they're going to gather a team there or not, but yeah, I, I totally missed that. Yep. Because the first thing that I saw was like the the hockey sweater at the end. Yep, that's mine. That's my bad. Yeah. I guess the problem, though, is like you can't really talk about 1993 without talking about 1994. And, you, and the White Sox can't talk about 1994. Yeah, they cannot. Right. As long as Jerry's still alive. They yes. cannot. But I would like them to come back, though, and, you know, have a, a reunion. I mean, for, yeah. for a lot of us millennials that's like our first successful white Sox team i was born in 84 so when everyone brags about the 1983 white Sox, i wasn't even alive Mm -hmm. Uh, i was barely alive for the chicago bears to win the super bowl (laughs) yeah no that was a team that that hooked me or at least like frank thomas was like oh this guy's cool right um so it was a couple years before then but like you know as i mentioned a few times i was originally an oakland a's fan because they had the guys who were fun to imitate in the backyard. Yeah. Like, you know, you can 
kind of do Harold Baines a little bit, but just they had all the fun guys, Ricky Henderson, Jose Canseco, and Dave Stewart. Uh, I imitated him like glaring over his glove and Dennis Eckersley's, um, you know, sidewinding delivery. Like they had all the fun guys who were good. And the White Sox just had like steady professionals at best. <laughs> you know, like Paul Canerco is not capture, capture the imagination the way like Frank Thomas did. Uh, and same thing with Harold Baines. Like he was clutch, but like as a six-year-old, like I don't really understand clutch. Like I understand like, uh, rooftop home runs and really fast guys who steal hundred base of the year and like have uh, bold black ink on the back of their baseball cards. When I'm looking through them, like who's this guy and why is just like, you know, why is he, why does he have an all-star card and why does he have this special diamond Kings uh -huh. <laughs> like, kind of stuff? Like that's how I learned about the game. And so like uh, my dad was like a hands-off baseball fan. Like he was happy. I like baseball and he wasn't going to say, no, you can't like them. And even like I met and uh, met Andre Dawson at the auto show. Like he was the first ball player I ever met and he was nice to me. And like, so I kind of like Andre Dawson a little bit. My dad's like, you know, if he was worried about me liking the Cubs, he didn't show it. Like he was just like, happy that I like baseball and they won the pennant in 80 or uh, they won the division in 89 that year. The Cubs did. And so like that could have been a moment where I jumped to the Cubs, but Unfortunately, or fortunately, they lost to the Giants and then the A's uh, beat the Giants in the earthquake series. Yep. And so like I still stuck with the A's until Conseco was traded. But like Frank Thomas was the guy who like, oh, he looks as fun as the Oakland guys are like. <laughs> and that's kind of how uh, they, they got my attention. And then they had some personalities as well. And they had Tim Raines and they had, um, you know, Jack McDowell, who was a lot of fun to follow just, you know, with a personality and Rob Matura made some awesome plays. So they had the finally had the talent that captured my like short attention span brain of like, I need big things to happen in order for me to really like them. And they did. So, yeah, Im very important team. I hope that they arrive in Chicago and they do something because I think that would be a great way to like reintroduce the 93 White Sox. You mentioned Robin Ventura. I think it would be enough time has passed since his managerial days that bringing him back and then White Sox fans could cheer for him as part of the 93. They're cheering on Robin Ventura, very good third baseman, not Robin Ventura, very bad <laughs> baseball manager and still having Frank Thomas out there and Tim Raines, <laughs> Uh, you could you, you see you would have Ozzy obviously join Alex Fernandez, Wilson Alvarez. You mentioned McDowell, him and Jerry Reinsdorf do, don't get along. So I don't know if Blackjack would come back to Chicago necessarily for that. You would obviously have Bo Jackson as well. Lance Johnson. I could keep on and on and on. I just think we talk about how the White Sox really didn't promote the 60s teams and they could have done more to help educate White Sox fans of all ages about the successful years. If they don't bring the 93 team back for some type of reunion, I think that's also another missed opportunity because a lot of these guys in their late fifties, early sixties, what are you going to do? You got to wait another 10 years of the 40th anniversary. You just don't know how many are going to be around and that would be unfortunate. I think this would be a good time to do it. And hopefully they do on April 15th, but if they just hand out crew neck sweaters and it's like, Hey, the 93 white Sox team. And the only person that comes out to throw out a first pitch is Ozzy Guillen. I just feel like that's a missed opportunity. Yeah. 1993 team with 1993 fashion, uh, <laughs> you know, classic crew neck sweater. I hope that's not it, but yeah, you, it's uh, I think, you know, after Tony LaRusso, Robin Ventura has to be forgiven as a manager. Like you weren't the problem. Like you were, but you weren't, you shouldn't have been there, but, you're not the reason why you were there. Yeah. <laughs> you were, like you didn't want the job. Like, like you initially you had to be talked into it. We get it. Um, we'll clap for you again. I think that has to be the reaction. Yes. I, I 100% agree. But again, Gary Peters, great life, great career with the Chicago white Sox, as he unfortunately passed away this past week at the age of 85 years old. But that will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. We also upload the podcast into our YouTube channel, which we are getting very close to 1,000 subscribers. We're at 991 the last time I checked. So you can listen and watch full episodes on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Machine and wherever you listen to podcasts such as Spotify and Apple Music. 
If you enjoy our work and want more, you can help us by supporting us at patreon.com slash socks machine where our patreon supporters they get exclusive content they get ad free versions of both the podcast and website and when there's new socks machine swag in the new socks machine store they're the first ones to receive it monthly plans start at two dollars or you can save with an annual subscription again sign up at patreon.com slash socks machine the socks machine podcast is a production of SoxMachine.com. you're on for all things chicago white Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Alongside Jim Margulis, I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching.